choosing the right camera can be an agonizing decision. And ideally, you want a camera that you can grow with, that you can grow into. And for me, that's exactly what the Komodo was. I've been shooting on the Red Komodo now for about two years. So I wanted to put out a deep dive video on this camera. So I guess you could call it a review. It's not really that. It's just sort of a collection of thoughts that I've had on this weird mutant little camera covering everything I've learned whilst using it over the years. As a working filmmaker, I've used this camera on so many different types of projects. Working as a solo operator or with crew or just creating content for this YouTube channel. So shooting everything from docs to music videos, basically. I want to share what it's like to shoot with this camera, uh, how I think it's improved my own work and the way I work. I'll cover why I decided to pick this camera up, but also look at the image quality, how I rigged the camera up for different types of jobs and the accessories I use, and how I've adapted my workflow to handle and grade raw footage in post. So if you've just picked up a Komodo or are looking to pick one up new or even used, I hope this video is useful. If you're new here, hello, hi, I'm Ed. I'm a London-based DP and filmmaker. I'd really love it if you could subscribe to the channel, uh, drop a comment down below to help out with the algorithm and check out some of my other videos. And just a quick note before we get into this, yes, I know Nikon just bought red, uh, but I'm not really gonna touch on that in this video. This is all about the Komodo. So let's get into it. I moved over to the Red Komodo from this. This is the Panasonic EVA 1. It's a compact cine cam. It's got internal NDs, XLRs on the back, a little LCD screen top handle. It just comes with everything you need to get shooting, basically. You just need a lens and a battery and away you go. After a few years, this thing was starting to show its age and I just wanted a step up. You know, I looked at some of the other options that were available at the time. So Canon C70, the Sony FX6, the Ursa Mini G2 and 12K, and even Panasonic's BS. 1H, but none of those really seem to be a substantial step up from something like this to justify splashing, you know, another five or six grand. The Komodo, however, just seemed to offer something a little bit more and seemed, on paper anyway, to be a worthy successor of my Eva. I guess at the time of buying, I was worried about, you know, the degree of hype behind this. Lots of people were talking about it online. I never owned a red camera before. I was worried whether this thing would be cumbersome to use, would slow me down. And in a sense, it did slow me down, but in the best possible way. It made me more intentional with the way I work, with the way I light and the way I shoot. It forced me to think a lot more about how I wanted my final image to be at the time of capturing it. And it also just forced me to learn how to sort of handle my images in post, in the grade. I'm not gonna lie, you know, the techie in me was also kind of intrigued by this thing. On paper, it doesn't really make much sense. It's an expensive crash camera. You know, it doesn't have any of the IO that a camera like this has. It was a punk, it's a bit of an outlier and that kind of intrigued me a bit. But it was a red camera and it was a red camera that you could hold in the palm of your hand. You could chuck it in a backpack and go traveling with it or you could rig it out to impress clients. Someone like me who takes on all kinds of jobs from solo operator to crew jobs, having a camera that can meet all those needs was a big draw for me. So if you can't be bothered to watch the rest of this video, here's the short version. I absolutely love this camera. I think it's probably one of the best cameras that I've ever bought. It has genuinely allowed me to grow as a filmmaker, as an image maker, as a color grader, all of the above. The Komodo has a 6K Super 35 sensor. Uh, it's what some people call Super 35 Plus in that it's on the wider end of sensors for that format with an almost two to one aspect ratio. You get a bit more real estate than you would on a typical Super 35 sensor, which is good news if you need to crop in to the sensor, which you generally need to do on red cameras if you want to um, shoot in higher frame rates. So it just means you start off with a slightly wider field of view. Uh, it's not quite full frame, but it's sort of in between Super 35 and full frame. It also has a global shutter, which means the whole sensor is exposed at once rather than line scanning downwards, which is what you find on typical CMOS sensors. Honestly, when I was first looking into the Komodo, you know, I thought this would be a bit of a bonus, a nice thing to have, but since shooting on it, I can tell you it is a big deal. <laughs> it definitely just opens you up to using more motion in your shots. And motion just takes on this kind of like 
different quality than it did when I was shooting on cameras like the Evo One or even my Lumix S5 2X. The motion in the Red Komodo just has this lovely cadence, this, I don't know, flowing cadence to it, I would say. It doesn't have any of that rolling shutter or jello effect that can be found in other cameras without a global shutter. Here you have a nice example of the limitations of a rolling shutter sensor, such as that found in the Lumix S5 2X. The problem with these sensors is that they capture an image or a frame by scanning from top to bottom. There's a bit of a delay involved in capturing the first part of the image and the final part of the image at the bottom. So if you have fast motion or something like a flashing light, the top part of the image may render that flashing light as on and by the time it's scanned to the bottom that flashing light may have cycled off, creating a sort of tearing effect where that light is only shown in half of the frame. On a global shutter camera such as the Komodo, you just don't see that. You either see the light rendered as on or off because the whole image is rendered at the same time. I've had an FX6 at home for a job for a few days, so I thought it'd be nice to shoot a comparison between the FX6, Panasonic Evo 1, and the Red Komodo. These are all shot at ISO 800. I believe I used the DZO film Vespids and then I used a different focal length for the FX6 to compensate for the larger sensor size uh, to provide a similar field of view for each shot. For me, the FX6 just sort of has this slightly weird video-y, low contrasty vibe to it. I think it'd be easy to mitigate in post. Uh, the Panasonic Evo 1 definitely pushes uh, a bit warmer, but definitely produces lovely results. Again, it's nice and punchy. But for me, the Komodo definitely has the most pleasing skin tone, in my opinion. The overall image, I think, maybe pushes a little bit green compared to the others. But again, across all of these, these minor differences can be sort of massaged in post. They give you enough to work with. But for me, I definitely think that the Komodo has the most pleasing, natural, organic image relative to the other two cameras. So when I was picking up this camera, one of the things that I was concerned with was its lack of high frame rates. So as you may know with RED cameras, uh, if you shoot in higher frame rates, then you need to reduce the resolution you capture in and crop in on the sensors. So at 6K, I think the most you can do is 40 frames a second. At 5K, 48 frames a second. And then at 4K, you unlock uh, 50 and 60 frames a second. Generally over the years, I've not actually had any major issues with the limited frame rates for what I shoot. I don't tend to shoot anything above 50 or 60 and actually I've just become very accustomed to shooting in 40 frames a second. The one thing I would note about 40 frames is that you just need to be careful uh, with indoor scenes, uh, with light frequencies, as uh, if you're keeping 180 degree shutter, you will probably get some strobing like if the lights are set to 50 hertz. Resolution-wise, I always capture in the full 6K. I think originally I was concerned that this would be overkill, but it's become kind of my new standard. I think it's a great middle ground uh, of giving you the flexibility in post without having to deal with crazy, you know, 8K file sizes or performance issues. And that would be one of the main things that would sort of hold me off from upgrading to something like the Red V Raptor. I'd kind of love it if they released a, a 6K global shutter. VistaVision camera at some point. I think there would be like a really nice market for that. It's always difficult to put this stuff into words, I think, but the Komodo image just has this thickness to it, I would say. You know, it's full of color. It's not over sharpened. It's not too digital looking, but it is still full of detail. It doesn't have this problematic noise reduction applied that you find on a lot of other modern digital cameras. This thickness I talk about, it's around the gradient of colours. Even in poor lighting, it holds up. Skin tones always seem to hold up unless you're really pushing it. And that's obviously because, you know, you have a 16-bit file to work with rather than, you know, whatever you might be shooting on compressed media, 10-bit or even 12-bit B-roll. But I'm not going to lie, it definitely took me a good six months to get in step with this camera and understand how to get the best image out of it. I look at the first video I rushed out after having this camera, you know, after 24 hours and there's lots I don't like about it. You know, it looks overexposed, uh, the colours are oversaturated and, you know, that's okay. You grow with your camera and the Komodo definitely gave me a lot of headroom to work with and 
over the period of time that I've been using this camera, I feel like I've got better and better at working with it. There is a bit of a learning curve into getting over it. I wouldn't say it's a particularly long or aggressive learning curve, but you definitely need to you know, learn how to use it, how to collaborate with it to get the best results that you want. I've said it before and I'll say it again, you know, if you put garbage in, you're gonna get garbage out. The Komodo is not a magic trash converter. So here's what you need to know. The Komodo obviously shoots raw. ISO is basically just like a monitoring alert. So you pick your ISO, and then you expose your image for that chosen ISO. And by toggling the ISO on the camera, you're basically seeing what the image would look like at that ISO in post. The Komodo is not what you might call a low light beast, but it's definitely capable of capturing, you know, beautiful, competent images uh, when exposing properly at ISOs 1000 and 1600. It's just not gonna allow you to sort of see in the dark like other cameras can. And I kind of think that the modern lineup of cameras has really influenced our expectations and perceptions of what a cinema camera or compact cinema camera should be. You know, the camera's not serving like a black box doing lots of hidden noise reduction and sharpening without any control over it. The Komodo is shooting raw and it's a raw image that you get to work with in post. The main thing that I think confuses people is that there are two statements and they go, ISO has no bearing on the image uh, that you're capturing on the raw sensor, the raw data. And then they'll go on to say something like, if you want to capture a dark scene, you should shoot at a low ISO. And if you want to shoot a bright scene, uh, you should shoot at a high ISO to protect your highlights. Uh, and I think that's where a lot of people get confused because they hear the first statement and they're like, well, I thought ISO didn't have any bearing on the image coming into the camera. So why are they then telling me to shoot at a higher ISO? So what you're effectively doing when you change the ISO on the Komodo is you're remapping its limited dynamic range. So lower ISOs uh, reallocate the dynamic range into the shadows. So if you're shooting a low light or low contrast scene, it's better to shoot at those and expose for those lower ISOs to get uh, less noise and more detail in your shadows. And vice versa, if you're shooting a bright contrasty scene and you wanna preserve those highlights and get a nice roll off in the highlights, uh, expose for higher ISOs like 1600 or 3200. This is a really quick example of what I'm talking about. We've exposed the same scene at four different ISO levels. So 800, 1600, 3200 and 6400. Obviously we're increasing the exposure by a stop each time. So I'm also cutting the light coming into the sensor by a stop by just reducing the shutter angle each time. So each shot has the exact same exposure. When we get it in post and we pull everything down by the same amount in each shot, this is where we really see what's going on. So as we cycle up through the ISOs, we can see detail returning in that LED light. And then if we look at the RGB parade, we can see some very stark differences between ISO 800 and 6400. The clipping point on ISO 800 is really severe and low down. As you go up, that clipping point increases. You're getting more range in your highlights. You're getting more roll off, more detail. So if you're exposing something with a lot of detail in the highlights and you really wanna protect that detail at the brightest parts of the image, shooting at a very high SO is gonna give you that maximum latitude. I think the other thing that confuses people is uh, when they hear something like the Komodo has a native ISO of ISO 800. If you are exposing at ISO 800 on this camera and targeting that ISO, you will get a sort of balanced range of highlight and shadow detail above and below middle gray. It's probably better to protect the highlights from clipping because it's almost impossible to bring that detail back um, and have slightly noisy shadows, which you can run noise reduction on than the other way around. That's part of the job, the eternal dilemma of being a DP with a camera with uh, limited dynamic range. You have to make those choices of what you're gonna sacrifice and what you're gonna save. Hello, I just wanted to cut in and say thank you to today's sponsor, which is Audio with Two Eyes. I've used tons of music libraries over the years, but I've recently moved over to using Audio. They have a awesome collection of tracks and they also allow you to break those tracks down into individual stems, which is great. But they also have some amazing search tools, which just speeds everything up, which is really important in music libraries. The first is Bolt, which helps you find similar tracks to the one that you're previewing. You just click the little icon and some 
AI wizardry pulls up a bunch of other similar tracks. But perhaps the coolest and most killer feature for audio is Link Match AI. Again, this uses clever AI wizardry to match basically any song that you link from places like Spotify or even YouTube to similar tracks in their library. Honestly, I was a bit skeptical about this at first before I used it, but it has genuinely saved time in my workflow. No more music library trawling. And you know what? They say time is money. So on top of that, to save you even more money, I've just got a discount code that gets you up to 70% off a pro plan. So jump down to the description, click my affiliate link and enter the code process 70 at checkout to get that chunky discount. Okay, back to the red Komodo. The traffic light system just give you this fantastic visual aid to quickly check uh, in on your exposure while you're shooting. Something that I wish all cameras had really. Here we have the top screen of the Komodo. You can see the traffic lights here. So they're basically three bars, colored bars. These are the red, green, and blue channels of the raw data. And they're basically just giving you feedback on whether you are clipping and losing information or underexposing and losing information in those channels. Those top traffic lights will first light up when you have overexposed or underexposed 2% of the pixels. And then if you overexpose more and more and more, uh, those lines will begin to travel upwards and they're basically saying you're just losing more and more information in those channels, i.e. like you're not gonna be able to recover that information in post and the same with underexposure. Because this is monitoring the raw data, changing the ISO will have uh, no bearing on the feedback of these traffic lights. So if you look at it here and we pump that ISO up, you'll see that those traffic lights remain the same. The histogram, however, will give you feedback on the exposure for whatever given ISO you're exposing at. So if you look at the histogram here and we move the ISO right back down, it's shifted right over to the left. So that is responsive to your ISO you need to sort of understand which bits of your image to protect and which to sacrifice. That's the eternal dilemma of a camera with limited dynamic range. The camera also has some excellent uh, exposure monitoring tools, you know, everything from zebras, false color. Uh, it also has a red specific tool called Geoscope. It's a kind of like false color, but is mapped specifically to the camera's, I think 16 stops of dynamic range. Me personally, I tend to rely on false color and the traffic lights. One other issue I picked up quite quickly was the Komodo sensitivity to IR pollution, especially when using certain variable NDs like the Canon drop-in VND adapter, which is really, really bad <laughs> in my opinion. I stumbled across this when I shot a documentary, The Farm, during the summer a few years ago, um, and I was mostly relying on that Canon VND adapter. And I just found uh, after the first day of shooting, I was getting these really muddy colors and polluted blacks. They were sort of like had a magenta shift in them, which is very characteristic of IR pollution. This is basically just a thing where like your camera sensor is basically sensitive to a small portion of IR light, which is just outside of the visible spectrum. And it sort of ends up interpreting this IR light as visible light. So it converts it into the eventual image. Black colors tend to radiate a lot of infrared light. It tends to be the blacks and some of the greens that are the most problematic when this problem occurs. So you can see the difference here. This is with and then without a screw on IR filter. So if you are using cheaper variable ND filters, a lot of them don't tend to cut that IR light. So they'll cut, you know, a huge proportion of the visible spectrum and allow all of that IR light to continue through to hit your sensor. So what you end up is overwhelming that sensor with tons of IR light, which then sort of messes up your image and uh, means you don't get very nice blacks. So if you are finding that you're having issues with blacks and colors when you are shooting in bright uh, sunlight, or even bright studio lighting, then that might be the issue and is worth looking into. You definitely invest in a decent, you know, IR NDs for your matte box. Can I be your fantasy? Can I be your inner dream? The Komodo is fantastic for anamorphic shooting as well. It just makes everything easier for you. It's very simple, very intuitive. Not only does it give you an abundance of anamorphic shooting formats covering nearly every single lens type available on the market right now, uh, it also automatically de-squeezes the footage for you ready to go in post, which is fantastic. The Komodo out of all cameras that I've used is by far my favorite to shoot anamorphic on whenever I get anamorphic lenses sent to test out. I'd check them on my Komodo. 
Yes, the Lumix cameras are fantastic and set up really well for anamorphic shooting, but the fact that this is all de squeezed for you uh, straight out of camera just makes the whole workflow a lot more simpler. So. Over the last years, I've shot on the Great Joy 1.8s, the Lauer anamorphic zooms, the Suray Satins, the Averscope, the Blazer Nero, the Lauer adapter, the Suray adapter, and the camera has just been great at handling all these different squeeze factors. When I first got the Komodo, I thought I'd be shooting the bulk of my projects in ProRes. So this camera allows you to capture full sensor, but at a 4K resolution in ProRes and saving RAW for the more important projects. Uh, and this is how things started off. This is how I began working with the camera. But the more I got my hands on the RAW footage, the more I worked with RAW footage, the more I just became accustomed to working with this footage. So although yes, the 4K, uh, ProRes footage is lovely and it's downscaled from 6K to 4K. You're not really benefiting from a camera like this unless you're shooting in RAW and the flexibility of the footage when you do capture it in RAW is just in a league of its own. The Komodo also has some excellent options for compressed RAW. Although at all points you're going to be dealing with large data rates, um, it does give you four levels to choose between. So generally I capture the bulk of my stuff in the LQ quality. And then for most of the YouTube content, I capture at the ELQ level. I shot a test documentary, The Farm, in RAW after getting the camera. And I just found that the RAW workflow made a lot more sense. It gave me a lot more flexibility in the footage. It was much nicer to grade. The 6K resolution also was really useful for stabilizing footage and recropping in post. And generally, like, performance and malleability of Red RAW in post is just, it's just fantastic. And I think once you start working with it, it's really hard to go back. In terms of grading my red footage, there's no one process that I use over and over again. I use a sort of library of different types of techniques. But anyone who's followed this channel over the last few years will know that I'm a big fan of Sir's Film Vision Power Grade. Sir is a YouTuber, check out his channel, I'll put a link in the description. But he's got this fantastic film emulation power grade that I particularly love and it's one of my favourite out of all of the various film emulation techniques. So I've used that for the last few years uh, and he recently uh, brought out a version two of this power grade, which I just in the last month started moving over to. Uh, it's much more streamlined. Lots of the stuff that you see on this YouTube channel is graded with that. It'll work across most camera systems and include LUTs that work across different camera log profiles. In terms of LUTs, I started off using the stock red LUTs and often still use those if I'm going for a more neutral look. More often than not, I'm using the Phantom LUTs and the ARRI LUT pack for red. These are some of the best LUTs I've come across in terms of creating a base grade, creating a nice pleasing starting point for my red image. I have a discount code in the description down below if you're interested in picking these LUTs up. In terms of the creative LUTs from Phantom, in the short doc I made last year, the studio, I used the Eastman uh, LUTs and I've also used the Vision and Teal LUTs in professional work as well. So really recommend checking these out. In terms of stuff like Dehancer, I've experimented with this over the years, but I've never really gotten on with it and just don't love it. Maybe when I've had a bit more time of it in the future, I'll move over to it. But for now, I'm really happy using the tools I've mentioned. And I'll use a combination of these techniques across the majority of my work and the majority of the stuff I'm putting out on YouTube. Sometimes I'll also combine it with the uh, film print LUTs in Resolve. You know, it all varies on a project to project basis. If you are concerned about whether your computer can handle red raw footage, Red on their website has loads of sample footage that you can download and test. Resolve also just has a number of excellent ways to sort of squeeze more performance out if you need it. So you can toggle the playback quality, you know, you can lower the project resolution and you can also obviously lower the raw decode quality uh, and there's loads of options there. All of it gives you a lot of sort of quick toggle options to increase performance on your computer. But you can obviously go down the proxy route as well if you need to. You know, it's not a coincidence that I moved my whole workflow into Resolve after getting this camera because previously I was working in Final Cut 10 and great for editing, but I quickly found that I wanted to move all of my sort of grading workflow into Resolve. This was just one of the main growing pains I had with owning this camera. Moving from shooting on sort of relatively manageable compressed media to shooting in RAW. 
And you know, when you're doing this on a weekly basis, uh, you're gonna be putting a lot of strain on whatever your storage system is and your backup system. And it can quickly like catch you out. So in the first year, I was continuously buying SSDs and spinning disk hard drives to shuttle projects around. And if you're cutting multiple projects in RAW at the same time, uh, you're gonna have to get used to spending a bit more money on your storage solution and you know, beefing it up a little bit. I'm about to invest in a proper NAS system, which is something I'm currently specking out. Um, it's something that I think after shooting on this camera for a year or two, you're gonna need as well. An average smallish project can, you know, with one or two days shooting can easily come in anywhere between two and four terabytes. Uh, if you're backing it up and you've got three of those projects on the go at the same time, then you need that capacity to manage all of that. Again, a big thing that a lot of people made a lot of noise about. My Panasonic Evo 1 had to be a black balanced, similar to black shedding sensor calibration. So it wasn't completely alien to me. A lot of people who, again, are coming to these kinds of cameras for the first time, you know, get in a bit of a muddle about it and get a bit stressed out. Where possible, black shade at the beginning of the day of every shoot, it's always gonna give you the best results. But if you don't or you forget, it's not gonna be the end of the world. Basically, when you calibrate the sensor, it is good to go within a certain uh, temperature range. I think it's plus five or negative five degrees either way. And the camera will tell you if it's outside of that calibrated range. So it has little symbols and they will be green if you're you know, basically good to shoot. If it's gotten too hot or too cold and the cam camera needs to be recalibrated, it will tell you. So as long as you're monitoring that, you should be good. You know, when I'm shooting YouTube content, I rarely black shade from whenever I black shaded it previously on a professional shoot. I've never noticed any huge issues or any weird things happening with the image. Generally, so long as you're not using the camera in environments with massively different temperature fluctuations or changes, then you're gonna be fine. What I love about the Komodo is that I can take this camera out with an absolute bare bones setup. So over the weekend recently, we were testing out some new lenses and we just went out on a walk and I chucked Komodo in a backpack with a single small V-mount battery and the outrigger handle. And I just used the top monitor to monitor the image and shoot whilst I was going. So this is really useful when I'm traveling and testing stuff out for this channel. You can have a really slimmed down shooting package, uh, sling it in a smallish backpack. It's just a great camera to walk about with, which surprised me. It means that if you are sort of a run and gun filmmaker, it's got you covered. It's really nice to sort of cradle and shoot with in this smaller configuration. I feel like it's a perfect form factor for handheld shooting. The Komodo body itself has quite a nice heft to it. And then when you add a lens and a small V-mount, it's just very nicely balanced. And it does come with the benefit of providing some nice stabilization and smoothing out those small camera shakes, even on a smaller setup. The power up time is probably going to be one of the biggest drawbacks for anyone coming from another camera, especially a DSLR, which, you know, might boot up in seconds. The Komodo is going to probably take 20 to 30 seconds. The top screen, it's okay. Like, it's fine. It works. It's not as responsive as I'd like it to be, which can be quite frustrating, to be honest. Uh, I don't know why it is so slow and unresponsive but it gets the job done. You know, when I'm out shooting YouTube content, um, I can easily get away shooting without uh, an external monitor. And that's fantastic because again, it just allows for this really streamlined and small shooting package. You can punch in to the image on the top screen to check your focus and it has various peaking modes to help confirm that. I obviously definitely wouldn't recommend doing that on professional jobs, but it certainly can be done in a pinch. I think one other thing I want to highlight, which is quite surprising is that when I first picked up the red, I thought it was gonna be incredibly technical and difficult to use, but it was the absolute opposite. This camera is so simple to shoot with. You're shooting in RAW, there's very little image processing that happens on the camera. No ISO or white balance issues if you set it wrong. You're pretty much booting the camera up, shooting your resolution, frame rate and shutter speed, and then you're good to go. And that's all you really need to monitor, you know, outside of your exposure and stuff. You know, when I compare this to something like the Lumix S52X or the Evil One, there are so many settings uh, on these cameras that it's just bewildering. And it's so easy to like set the camera up for one type of shoot one day and forget to toggle the setting on and off for a shoot on another day. It's so streamlined that you don't have any of that to worry about. And it's just all about focusing on getting the best image possible. If you're shooting in RAW, you're either exposing it properly or you're not. This is my red Komodo rig, the rig I use for probably 
90% of jobs. The heart of it all is the bright tangerine left field system. This consists of a base plate and some side plates. Uh, you can see these little side plates here. They just add some handy little mounting points to the side of the camera without sort of adding too much additional weight or bolt. I use the outrigger handle. It is expensive for what it is, but it just works and it does what it does very well. Uh, it has a start stop record button. It's going to be your main point of contact with your camera if you're shooting a lot of handhelds. On top of that, we've got a small rig NATO plate uh, that screws in. I think it's 110 millimeters. This just allows me to mount additional accessories like my top handle power. I'm using the Tilsa Advanced power plate V mount pretty much lived on my camera since I got it. It has a bunch of expansion ports. So we've got some two pin limos, DTAP, USB, and then some time code expansion. It connects into the Canon BP battery slots and then is wired into the extension port at the back of the Komodo. The best thing about this plate is that it does communicate battery information to the camera so you can get a visual indication of how much battery you've got left. Battery wise, uh, I use V mounts. I tend to use either 98 watt or 148 or 150 watt batteries. I've got one of these V150 micro B-Bob batteries. Uh, I love it. Uh, I think you could probably get through a whole day on just two of these. I don't own many RF lenses. I think the Nightwalkers are the only native RF lenses I use. Obviously, I need a lot of adapters. I've got the Canon VND adapter and then the Canon EF speed booster 0.71 times. I'm trying to be a little bit more intentional when I use the speed booster and not just slap it on all the time. The thing to note about the speed booster is because the Komodo sensor is slightly wider than other Super 35 cameras, when you times the crop of the Komodo, which is about 1.33 by the speed booster, which is 0.71, you're actually getting back to more than full frame. So you've got to be careful, especially if you're shooting on full 17.9 sensor, that your lenses aren't going to vignette if they only cover up to full frame. I use the vest bids and I do notice some vignetting at the corners, especially when I'm shooting in 17.9 mode. So just be careful. Uh, I definitely test it out if you are going to be using a speed booster. I predominantly shoot on the DZO Film Vespids. I have them in EF mount. A full set, I've had them for a few years. In terms of focal lengths, I tend to bounce between 21, 40, 35 and 75 the most. I would say with the speed booster, the 40 millimeter is a great all rounder. In terms of storage, I use these Angelbird AV Pro CF cards. I have two of them and then one terabyte. I use these now for two years continuously, day in day out, and I have never had any issues touch wood. Top handle, uh, I've got a few. This is just a, an old small rig one, which just tends to be my favorite. It has lots of mounting points, has this nice swivel function. Monitor wise, I started off with a five inch, but ended up moving on to this Atomos seven inch Shinobi. Just because once you've got the red overlay on your image, uh, it does take up a bit of real estate on the monitor. And then I use this Arri locking pin connection and I connect that in line at the top of the handle. Where possible, I follow the SDI protocol. You know, there's been times where the cable's been pulled out or whatever, and I haven't followed it, and the camera has been fine. But generally, for best results, just follow that. Audio wise, since the beginning, I've been using this Zoom F3. It's a tiny 32 bit float recorder, two XLR inputs. This just connects to this little um, bright tangerine side plate, cheese plate, which has a NATO attachment. I think it's designed actually to go on the other side of the camera. Um, and this is a really nice idea because then it allows me to have a sort of side XLR attachment that sort of fits around everything. And it's got the NATO rail, so it's very quick to pull off if you need to swap cards or, you know, just go more lo-fi. And then because of that, it's quite easy just to sort your cable management out underneath. And then this is just the base plate. It's the Bright Tangerine left field system. It connects into a Ari dovetail plate, which pretty much permanently sits on my tripod. It's got two points of release from the tripod, so you can take the whole camera very quickly off the plate, or you can take the camera with the left field plate off the tripod and keep the rods connected. Honestly, really recommend the Bright Tangerine ecosystem for your Komodo. I started off with a small rig cage just to get me going and quickly got this. It is fantastic. It just works. Because I also like to shoot shoulder mounted, it perfectly integrates with their Bright Tangerine Casbar system and I use that when I want to shoot shoulder mounted. To get into that shoulder mounted setup and to get it working, this took me a while to figure out, but I just connect a little eye footage spider arm to the top handle and that pushes the monitor forward and I use that longer cable to cable it in. And then in terms of matte box, I tend to use, again, the Bright Tangerine Misfit Atom and I use format high tech filters or I'll use my Revering VND. So yeah, that's my rig. One of the Komodo's secret weapons is definitely the red control app. And honestly, this thing is incredible. 
And it's just now integral to my operation of this camera. I honestly can't understand why other camera brands haven't quite nailed this wireless camera control app in the way that Red has, because the app is just so good. It's like fantastic. It adds a whole other layer to operating the camera. On most shoots now, I'll bring my old iPad and I will monitor the image on the iPad. If I'm interviewing someone, I have full camera control from my lap on the iPad. I have a nice image to monitor. I can check focus. If I'm on an autofocus lens, then I can uh, adjust focus, f-stop. If I'm working with an assistant, they can monitor the image whilst I'm monitoring from my production monitor. It can double up also as a great client or director's monitor. There's been so many times where I've like impressed a client by just whipping out my iPad and like, here you go, you can have a look at the image and what I'm shooting and see what my camera sees and they love it. It's super stable and reliable. It doesn't drop connection. Everything is super customizable to how you want. You can change the layout, the orientation, all that sort of stuff. Shooting YouTube stuff with it, if I shoot my talking head with this camera, it makes life so much easier because I can just use my iPad. I can trigger records. I can monitor the shot and make sure everything is good. Uh, you can get playback on it as well, which again is just great for showing clients quickly. Uh, and you can also take screen recordings on your iPad as well, which is also really cool and great for like notes or um, you know, checking your setup. It's just awesome. There's a few things. I mean, lack of IO and limited audio connectivity is a bit of a hassle. I picked up the Zoom F3 and that's been absolutely fine over the last two years. It's been a great companion to the Komodo. So generally I record everything externally to that and then just sync it in post. And then for larger projects, I am working with a sound op anyway. So it's a bit of a moot point. I did come from a camera with XLRs to a camera without, so it was a bit of an adjustment period. Uh, no internal NDs, no stabilized sensor. Again, the NDs was probably the biggest issue here. Uh, I was used to having that on my Eva, but again, using a map box, using a decent variable ND overcomes that, so that's not been too bad. And I think the only other thing was really like the slowness of the and responsiveness of the camera. Generally, it is just takes a bit longer to rig up at the beginning of the day on a shoot. It takes a bit longer to boot up, change batteries, reset the configuration. You know, if we're shooting a long interview and then going to shooting handheld or something like that. The power draw on the camera is maybe a little bit more than what I was used to on other cameras. So yeah, I can easily get through a day of three or four V-mount batteries. So bringing those with me as well, you know, it's extra weight, extra baggage to transport. Lack of autofocus hasn't been a deal breaker. I shoot on the Vespids, which are manual focus lenses. Um, since getting the Lumix S52X, I have become more accustomed to um, shooting with autofocus and the benefits that that brings. But generally it hasn't really been a huge limitation to the work that I produce. I think one of the biggest limitations is if you shoot a lot of run and gun, you need a camera that's very quick to operate and use and boot up and run around with. It maybe isn't the best camera for that, but that's not to say that I haven't shot all those kinds of jobs with this camera. It's just whether having a camera like the FX6 might be more appropriate, it might give you slightly better results. When I knew Red were going to release another Komodo variant, the Komodo X, I was a little bit worried about what this camera would be, but Actually, when the Komodo X launched, I wasn't disappointed and I didn't regret, you know, having picked up or invested in the original Komodo. And there's several reasons for that. The Komodo X is a lot more expensive and it was at, it was priced at a certain price point where I was like, okay, I'm happy with the camera I have, you know, it was half the price. All in, the Komodo cost me around nine to 10 grand to sort of rig up and have it all ready to go. The Komodo X, I think you're gonna be closer to 15 grand uh, once you factor in all the things you need to buy additional to it. So yes, the Komodo X is a fantastic camera. I feel like it's the sort of like fully realized, updated, evolved version of the Komodo, fixing all of the issues in the weird mutant prototype Komodo, maybe if you could call, if you want to call it that. But I've learned to work with all the quirks of this camera and I still love using it. I don't feel like I'm bumping up against anything at the moment that is too problematic. I think with the Komodo X, you obviously get improved autofocus, it has better IO, which again is gonna make things more efficient. It has slightly better low light performance. It has color science that is more closely matched to the Raptor's color science. So if you're using those two camera systems, they'll match a little bit better in post. But again, I love the image from the Komodo. It's a great camera. And I think if you are gonna be picking up a Komodo secondhand, 
the price has dropped quite a lot since um, it was first released where the Komodos were a lot more scarce and the used price was a lot higher. Now I think you can get used Komodos for between 4,000 and 5,000 pounds, maybe even lower. If you are just interested in pure image quality, I think it's the best value for money that you can get in any of any camera. I watched Blackmagic's NAB announcement yesterday and saw that they'd announced some new cameras, including their new Pixel, Pixie, Pixel 6K box style camera. I feel this is the camera that perhaps they should have announced two to three years ago. When I originally picked up the Komodo, I actually waited until NAB that year to order the Komodo because I was hoping that Blackmagic was going to announce a box style camera that would be better value or do other things that the Komodo couldn't do. But they didn't. And the problem I think with this new 6K camera is that there are two parts to a camera. There's the sensor and then there's everything they build around it. And whereas everything that's built around it looks fantastic and versatile and sort of next gen, the sensor tech in it is very much old gen. So I think it's got the IMX, is it 410? It's a Sony sensor. It's a sensor we've seen in so many cameras over the last five years. If I was investing in a sort of flagship A cam today, I don't know whether that sensor would be future-proofing my workflow for the next three to four years. It's mainly because, you know, it's a sensor we've seen in the S1H, Lumix cameras, uh, the Kinfinity cameras, obviously in the older Blackmagic uh, 6K they released earlier this year or end of last year, it delivers a fantastic and beautiful image and that's why we've seen it in so many cameras, but it does suffer from one key issue, which is its slow sensor readout. It has really bad rolling shutter. And the other thing that I find puzzling about this camera and who it's pitched at is that it only shoots in B-RAW, so there's no ProRes, there's no compressed recording, which then locks you into using Resolve. And I love working with B-RAW and I love working in Resolve, but as professionals, as cinematographers, we're not the ones who are always editing the footage we shoot. We're handing that footage off to other editors. It's not great for clients if you're sending them footage that locks their editor into using uh, a certain editor. The great thing with being able to send ProRes or even Red Raw is that it will function in pretty much any editor out there. It would then lock me out of using that camera for lots of different projects, or I'd have to transcode all the footage before I send it, which just, just takes so much time. I think therefore it lacks some of that versatility that a lot of people at that end of the market are gonna need. So I would question that even though it is aggressively priced at around the 3,000 pound mark, you know, for around £4,000 now, you can pick up a used FX6 or Komodo. And I just wonder at that price point whether those cameras offer more versatility for professionals at this end of the market. So, yeah, that's my thoughts on this new camera and this new release. I'd be really interested to know what everyone else thinks down in the comments down below. So let me know. Things that I love about this camera far exceed the things that I don't love about it. With the Komodo, I don't really feel the need to upgrade. I think the next thing that I would upgrade is maybe picking up a, a compact cine camera that was more uh, attuned to sort of run and gun work. So if I find like a good FX6 used or Lumix come out with another compact cine camera with great autofocus, I might consider that while still holding on to the Komodo because I think for me, I can see myself using the Komodo for at least another two or three years. And the only reason I'd want to pick up another camera is if I start taking on more jobs that might need something like autofocus and might benefit me from that. I love the Komodo OG so much that it's going to be sticking around for a few years. It doesn't have to worry about getting the boot anytime soon. There are tons of stuff I could have talked about, but I think this is getting long enough anyway. Uh, if you have any questions about working with the Komodo or buying a Komodo or anything I haven't quite covered in this, please just drop it down in the comments down below. I have affiliate links to all the kit mentioned in the rigging section of this video, also in the description. So if you want to purchase or pick up any of those, please consider using the affiliate links. It really helps support this channel. Anyway, if you've made it this far, thanks for watching. Consider subscribing if you're not, like the video, drop me a comment. But that's it. Until next time, see you later.